Well, my name is Saiki Louie. I am from Hong Kong originally, and I'm Canadian. Uh, and I've been living in Boston for many years now. And I, I, I study music and the brain. Uh, I, my lab is called the MIND Lab, where MIND stands for Music, Imaging, and Neural Dynamics. And I teach about music and the brain and music cognition and perception. And it's great to be here. Birger. I'm Berger, I'm German. Um, I'm now again working in Germany, um, specifically in Hamburg and a research project on music perception and production related to time. Uh, so I'm a postdoctoral researcher in that uh, project and um, my specialization is in music and movement, music induced movement, so how people spontaneously move and synchronize to musical input. I'm professor of systematic musicology at the University of Hamburg and um, one of my main fields is psychology of music and I'm interested in music and time. Right now uh, we, we've got the project uh, on slow motion transformations of musical time and perception performance but I'm also interested in various other projects uh, such as music in hospitals for instance and well it's nice to have contributed to MUTOR. John McCallum, uh, originally from California um, and just landed in Germany a couple of years ago. Uh, my background is in music composition. Uh, I do some performance, uh, lots of software design and engineering, and um, I worked on the original Mutor project uh, back, I guess, over 10 years ago with uh, Psyche when we were both in California. And I'm working now at the HFMT with, uh, with Georg, and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. And I'm Georg Kaidu. I'm a composer, but also a trained uh, scientist. Um, and, um, and I'm also a professor at the Hochschule für Musik und Theater, teaching multimedia composition. Talk tonight is supposed to be a very informal chat. We have prepared a few topics. And we said that each of us can be a moderator at any time. But since I was the one that started this project many years ago, our first try was in 2006. Now I wanna quickly mention one name that is of utmost importance in this context. That's the name of David Wessel. Um, David had an impact on most of us uh, directly or indirectly. Also Clements and Brigitta, you're probably also aware of his work. Um, and I wanted to ask um, uh, Psyche and John a little bit about the methodology, how this original material all came about. So how did you work with David? I would say it was formative in my early 20s. Uh, in my first year of graduate school, so I had before starting my PhD, but um, I it was my first real job was to be a graduate student instructor for David Wessel's music perception and cognition course. Um, and I remember being, uh, you know, just barely graduated from undergrad. And suddenly there are these graduate students that are supposed to, whose papers I was supposed to be grading. And so that was a little intimidating. Um, but David was a really kind instructor. Um, he always came to class with lots of interesting ideas. Uh, he always showed up a little bit late, sometimes more than a little bit late. Um, this was also not uncommon for UC Berkeley. Um, and then, and he also had, uh, sometimes he had maybe more ideas in his head than would fit into, uh, into the lecture class. Um, but he was always interesting and always inspiring. Um, so I, I think that I remember the first time he really explained the materials of music perception and cognition to me, which is kind of still how I explain things to students, is, um, is that when he was drawing it on a whiteboard, he was drawing these graphs on a whiteboard, and he was plotting, uh, he was doing a mock-up of the, the protone profiles, which of course are part of the, the units on pitch. Um, and just talking about how in C major, you know, this one's high and this one is next highest and so on. And, and it just made so much sense to me. I mean, he had a way of really clearly explaining 
um, concepts. Yeah, I think he was a really um, joy to teach for and with. And in terms of how the material uh, of Mutor One actually uh, came about, there was, uh, I think it was uh, because of you, Georg, uh, who had, I think, um, kind of sparked the, the first Mutor. Uh, and then that led to me and John being the, the ones that were tasked with transcribing what David wrote, uh, David talked about uh, into, uh, into, a, a, into a website at the time and so we would just sit together with him in a room and he would talk and we would take notes and that was how the first course came to be um yeah that was a beautiful recollection and uh i i that i could was i don't know just really uh that was very evocative and and uh very accurate with my my rem remembering of david um I, I used to say that you know uh like working at Senmat with David, I had the impression that I could do anything, like I, I that anything was possible and that any, anything was was exciting. And uh, he just had such a, a positive spirit. And like he, whenever, whenever he would open the door and walk through the front door, he would say, all right, and just look around and see who's there and, and want to talk to people. And he would always come with some idea that he had that he was bringing from some other part of the campus about some conversation that he had had about some deep learning algorithm or some new new paper on this or that, and he just needed to find the first person in the building that he could talk to and and um, and wonderful to work with and very supportive and very uh, encouraging, and had a really great way of um, in terms of research of. Um, you know, kind of directing you away from dead ends and towards where the fruit was and. Uh, yeah, just just a great a great personality. What I found astonishing quite early on was a young student to meet the people who had conducted the research. I found that always fascinating because I had the feeling that I would get more an idea of what actually uh, was uh, driving them. There was more flesh to the research if I had met the person and if I heard them talking and presenting their research. So. Well, that's quite important, def definitely, yeah, to, to, to meet the people behind the research. Been an exchange student in Stockholm, and it's called differently now, but there's a music technology group at KDH. Um, and there were quite constantly visitors from the, from the labs in Europe. So that was very nice to have people in an informal situation to just like have coffee or something and just talk to them and get to know them and I was just a little like master students conducted my master thesis there so but they were talking to me so <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, it was a very nice experience and I I met the people from Evascula there for the first time and then ended up doing my PhD there so it was a nice coincidence as well. Uh, something that I also noticed when I was doing my studies in molecular biology is what I really appreciated was also over always the flat hierarchies that people were talking to each other and then they didn't you didn't really have to look up so much you know you had you didn't have to pay respect to people um, that uh, of course is something that we all also have in common that we're not just probably all in common uh, that we are not just uh, researchers but we are all also uh, musicians that um, have learned to practice or to perform on an instrument for, for many years. So Psyche, I know you're a pretty accomplished violinist. I, I just wanted to ask you all, how did the, your first music classes or you, uh, learning an instrument ever shape your desire to embark on something like uh, this here, like becoming cognitive uh, psychologists or becoming composers, uh, which is in certain ways a practical application of cognitive psychology. Maybe not everyone will agree, but I look at it that, that way. Um, well, I started playing piano when I was five and violin when I was seven. Uh, and I never liked to practice, but I did like to perform and I did very much like to play with other people. I think there was a moment when I started uh, playing in an orchestra. Um, I, I was maybe 
10, nine or 10. And that really felt like a, it was a life changing experience. It's just, just the thrill of being, uh, you know, doing the same thing with all these people. It was so, uh, so exciting. Um, but yeah, at the same time, I'm from a, a fairly, I guess, um, uptight uh, Chinese family where uh, it was also expected that I, I study science and go into a very uh, more lucrative um, career in the end. Uh, so I was supposed to go and become a medical doctor. And I, I did start taking my pre-medical uh, school courses in undergrad, uh, but then I also started taking some uh, some courses in psychology. And it was my third year in undergrad, and I, when I took a course on uh, on cognitive neuroscience, um, and this was happening at the same time as I was also taking some courses in the music department, learning about you know, music theory and so on. I came across uh, some papers by Stefan Kolsch, uh, for example, and some others that had looked at using event-related potentials and electrophysiological recordings on humans um, as they were listening to different chords and chord progressions. And, you know, those specific chords were something I was learning about in my music courses. And so it felt like what I was learning from my music courses uh, was making contact with what I was learning from my science classes. And that felt really exciting to me. Um, and I think in general, I was just really seduced by this idea of of how we can use some relatively objective methods to understand some seemingly very subjective experiences. And I think that's what drove me towards uh, this line of work. Um, and then of course, along the way, if we can use what we learn from music cognition to make something that's good for humans, you know, whether it's like has some therapeutic value or has some is aesthetically rewarding, I think that's uh, very nice to have as well. I, uh, when I was about 12 or 13, I really wanted to play the guitar. Uh, my stepdad was a, a jazz keyboard player and my grandfather was a music teacher and French horn player. So music was around a lot. And um, I really wanted to play the guitar. Mainly I wanted to play rock and roll and punk and, and uh, um, heavy metal and stuff. And so my mom got me guitar lessons and it was all classical and I really loved it. I didn't know the, the music very well, but I really liked it. And um, at some point I knew I wanted to go to music school, um, but I knew that I didn't want to make performance a, a living, on, at least on the guitar. Um, so I started studying composition and uh, I was at the University of the Pacific in Stockton, California. And uh, yeah, they had a, a lute teacher, they had a guitar teacher who I was studying with who also uh, had studied the lute and I was really excited about that. So I ended up getting a lute and studying with him and also studying the harpsichord with the harpsichord professor there and loved all this early music. Um, you know, the, er, the look into um, early music performance practice really changed my way of, of thinking about music in general. Um, and I was studying music theory quite a lot um, and majoring in composition and um, you know, I had all these questions about music theory, like why, you know, these rules, what are these rules about? Because that's how they kind of teach it in, in the States. And like, what, you know, why can't you do parallel fifths or, or whatever? And one of the answers is, well, because they didn't. But um, when I was at McGill, I started to get other answers like, well, because, you know, the two voices disappear into one. And that is like a whole other question, like, well, why does that happen? Why do we hear it that way? And it was, for me, it, it was my first contact with David was, he was like a really the kind of source that was able to synthesize these two different answers, one from a performance practice standpoint and one from a sort of uh, cognitive psychology standpoint. And um, he, he, for me, kind of um, uh, was the first time that I had really seen the sort of mixture of all of the different interests that I had and, uh, and served as a sort of role model for me in, in saying, well, I don't have to keep these things separate. I really should bring them together, actually. When I was 11, I think, continued that during teenage years and became quite interested in music technology in my teenage years. Um, and then, yeah, ended up studying systematic musicology in, in Köln. Got very interested in the mathematical part and perceptual part so what does music actually do with us not like I, i've been interested in music theory as well but kind of put that aside and was more interested what sounds actually are and what they would do with us as a listener and then got quite much into this like everyday use of music 
uh, kind of topic. So, um, so I'm probably the least interested of us um, in the actual music, but more in how we use music and why music is such an important thing for, for, for us humans. This uh, class, the science of music class is like truly interdisciplinary in its nature. And I can I'll, I'll tell from your answers that you kind of represent this kind of interdisciplinary approach to, uh, to music and science. So this is the common ground. And this is also something that we could see in uh, the work of David Wessel. And another person that I should also uh, mention here, a uh, teacher of mine also, I also studied in Cologne, by the way. And um, so, um, and I see the, the poster on your wall, for oh, yeah. song, which is uh, made of music. Uh, yeah, exactly. Music notation. Um, it's getting a bit closer. And I remember yeah. seeing the same poster in Clarence Barlow's um, apartment. Don't call it. <laughs> and he himself actually made such uh, diagrams, such graphics himself that he was very much into, you know, um, rather humorous sides of music. What I was wanted to um, talk about a little bit is when we, uh, John and I, uh, we talked about the, the topics for tonight, and I suddenly remembered a a term that Oliver Sacks has used in, in connection with, with his writings on neurology. He referred to that as romantic science. Um, so it's when uh, storytelling um, meets neurology. So my question to you is, do you think that this class is like real hardcore science, or do we also encounter a bit of uh, romantic science in here as well? Well, I don't actually think that just because it's romantic that it's unscientific, right? I mean, it can be hardcore and romantic. There's something very romantic about hardcore science. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think that th there's something beautiful about how Oliver Sacks personalizes his stories, right? So taking the story of one patient and then just going about uh, learning about this person's backstory and what made that the, the patient tick. Um, and I think that's what makes his narrative so beautiful and also made the, the science even more interesting. Um, I mean, I, I think that the work that we cover in this course are not quite like that in the sense that there are relatively few case studies per se, right? But certainly, when we write about the findings, right, the results, um, let's say, you know, we have one unit uh, or, or subunits on congenital amusia, right? Um, I think for every one of those studies, there are many stories that can come out of it, right? Like I can actually sit and talk all day about uh, about these special cases that have come across my lab and that and the conversations that we have with them um, and the music that they like to listen to or didn't like to listen to. Um, and I think that's part of uh, the beauty of it is that you know, when you're looking at the data, it's it's really a, a boiled down representation of uh, a much more rich experience. And so I think part of new science science these days or the, the future direction, uh, um, we are trying to get more um, representations out of the data or richer data so that it's uh, less boiled down and more close to um, to the subjective experience while also still being hard science. I would completely agree. So uh, the beauty also of the material which is presented in Mutual, I believe is that um, it's uh, science, it's, it's results, it's knowledge which is derived from empirical testing and um, very controlled studies and experiments. But of course, the outcomes relate to what everybody perceives and everybody can make a connection to their daily lives and to listening to music, which we do multiple times a day, I guess most of us. And, um, and that's where life comes in and it's closely related to everybody's lives. And um, what I believe is nice and big advantage of an initiative like Mutor is really that uh, it brings these knowledge to people in a good and organized way, such as uh, we would do in our classes. And you can get an insight to knowledge and into research areas, which otherwise are perhaps a little bit hard to get access to. When you read um, 
textbooks, articles, you need to have some basic knowledge already, or when you read something on Wikipedia, which for many subjects is really a great resource, then sometimes it's very basic, very broad, and sometimes it's, it seems to be quite specialized, the, the knowledge that is presented there. And I believe that, that online courses such as Mutor can really bring something to, to it, to the field and to interested readers that, that combines those two approaches, the specialized and the more basic one perhaps, and, and, and make knowledge available to, to many people. So I think that's one very good thing about it. John, I understand that you have, that it was important to you to always include um, compositional aspects too, like the uh, discussion of, you know, 20th century, 21st century composition is, is something that is, um, is, is central to, uh, to your interest. Yeah, for sure. And again, that, that came from David's encouragement as well. Uh, that was important to him. And I think it came through in his teaching uh, and I would say the same uh, watching you teach this, this term, Georg, I, that I see that in your teaching as well, that you're not just presenting, you know, what, what we know about this field, but rather what you care about and giving people some information about, you know, what, what you value in this material and, and why it's valuable to you, uh, which I think brings it to life. And I think it speaks to what Clayman said earlier about um, meeting some of these, the people in these fields who you had read their papers and understood their, their research and you meet them and somehow it gives, it puts more, more meat on the, the bones of these papers somehow. I think that that's an important part of the way that this material is taught in the classroom, uh, at least as I'm watching Georg uh, and also I, as I had worked with David. Um, and I think it, to, some, to some degree, as best we can, it's captured in, in the text in, in, the, in the online materials, which I think is a, a very valuable, um, I think that was one of the original intentions. And I think that that's, that's happened to some degree, which I'm happy about. I would say this class is um, definitely very uh, personal because it uh, allows us to somehow combine our interests in, in music theory, in psychology, in how the brain functions on uh, and um, various other aspects that could be of some various target audiences, not just uh, students, but I think in, you know, this term citizen science has become so um, you know, widespread recently. And um, so, in, so in other words, it is also important to cater to a general public that is interested in uh, interdisciplinary research and questions concerning um, music and, and science. You talk about it uh, occasionally when students, for instance, are very critical about what value some research findings have. And, and sometimes I tell them that basic research and, and most of the research we are doing is, uh, could be considered to be basic research, I would say, um, can stir new questions and, uh, and generates knowledge. And obviously it's, it's quite important how to translate this to, to people who are not specialists. And then, of course, in music psychology, we have lots of areas which are also more applied, perhaps. For instance, right now, there is a bunch of research about music and social distancing and music under COVID-19 uh, conditions. But such research has a, or could have a strong effect on people's lives and, and, and actually is very close to, 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 the, to the experiences people make. And um, in a way, it, it would be an ideal also via mutual and other such initiatives to enable people to, to understand what we are doing and to communicate, uh, first of all, to communicate the research findings so, so that people can get more insights into it, definitely. So, and, and I believe that students are excellent multiplicators in this way. Um, if this is an English word, I don't know, but uh, they, they can tell, they can share the knowledge and they can talk with their friends who don't study music and then tell, tell everybody about our field. And, and of course, on the other hand, we, we have a, a responsibility to, to interact with media. So we get, frequently we get some interview questions and, um, and demands for giving answers to, to certain topics. And, and that's, that's an obligation as well, I believe, as, as researchers.
I mean, I think it's uh, the open science framework. I mean, it is a really useful platform for um, for sharing data and sharing hypotheses, sharing um, you know materials for studies. Really, I mean, I, I think of uh, open science as kind of contributing to a larger ecosystem in a way, right? Because there, for every a data set that we collect, right, we could probably analyze them many different ways. Uh, and especially, you know, I, I work with brain data a lot in my lab. Um, and the, the brain is, of course, a three dimensional object with many, many, many layers uh, of, of detail that you could um, use to look at, um, to look at it. And so um, when I collect one data set, it makes sense to make it available to be looked at in multiple ways. Um, and it's, I think it's more economically viable. And I think it also lowers the the barrier for entry for early career younger researchers who maybe they don't have their own grants to to collect a bunch of brain data but maybe if we, if we make some of these data available online uh, then they can start to address that to look at data in a way that starts to address their own hypotheses and generate their own um, their own interests uh, and i think um, that the next generation of researchers can uh, i think ha has a lot to benefit from these open science practices That's uh, definitely uh, an important element, and also outreach, as uh, Birgitta mentioned, it is, is, is a very um, big element in that. And and uh, we are also at the Hochschule doing a large outreach uh, project. And uh, this uh, class is, is being taught in the context of a uh, initiative that was started a few years ago in Hamburg uh, called the uh, Hamburg Open Online University to bring uh, science and the arts to a more general audience.